So with also with magazines, there's different magazines. When you get a custom gun, most of the guys have what they call a drop box, which is you got the little button that drops your ammo out. Then you got the blind magazine, which is a little bit lighter, but it's harder to unload the rifle. Then you got clips, and usually there's two kinds of clips. There's the inline feeding clips, which are probably the best feeding. Typically though, if you have one that holds more than three or four and you go inline, the clip is going to stick below the, the, the gun. So it's going to make it a little bit more difficult to pack. It's going to feed nicer. So if you got like a wildcat gun or a really fat case, the inline, like Badger Hornets, for example, makes them, and it goes on a normal stock. So guys who go on really high-end sniper-type guns, a lot of times have an inline feed. It just feeds a little bit more consistent. The more you got to jog the, the ammo back and forth, especially if it's a short, fast case, they won't feed as well. Another trick that, I, that I've read and talked to gunsmiths about, when you get a gun, especially this is more important for a dangerous game rifle, but they'll, they'll take empties and they'll put empties inside and feed empties. If your gun will feed empties, it'll pretty much feed anything. But don't just assume that you buy a new, new kind of ammo that all the bullets will feed properly. So if I'm going on a dangerous game hunt, especially if I'm going to be reloading, before I shoot, before I shoot them, I put everything in there. Sometimes they'll feed great on the first shot, and then the second one coming up won't feed properly. So I slam them home just like if I was doing it. I want to make sure there's not going to be any, you know, screw ups. And when you load your gun, you need to make sure that you. I always put the casings in the back. Don't alternate them because sometimes when you go down, then the tip will hit on the lip of the front of the magazine box and it won't feed properly. So again, it sounds trivial, but when you got a ground bird coming at you or you got follow up shots and having the gun jam or having one not get ejected properly is not cool. So make sure your gun feeds properly before you go on a trip. And again, especially on a dangerous game. Um, so it's custom, yeah, there's so many custom gun packages out here, it's crazy actually. Um, you know, you have, you have the complete systems and then you have what I call the self-customization, which you can choose what you want. Complete systems would be like, say, Best of the West, Gunworks, um, Great Bull Precision, there's other ones out there. But you basically, you're buying a gun that comes with an ammo loaded for it. You buy, it has a scope mounted on it. It's basically ready to go. It's probably sighted in. They have those. Some, some of the companies actually do what I call semi-custom. Say, for example, Gunworks. There's not, it's not a full custom. It's not custom for that specific gun, but it's semi-custom loads that they give you. Other ones, you know, they will actually have custom loads, custom dies for your hunting rifle. I mean. Depends on how much money you want to spend. It depends on if you like to reload yourself. There's advantages to buying the custom systems that are all ready to go. The biggest disadvantage is sometimes people don't have enough trigger time on them. So if you if you if you're a reloader, I find that the guys shoot their guns a lot more. So in theory, you have a gun if you buy a custom system that's ready to go. But in practicality, you don't have enough experience unless you shoot it to make long shots. Um, you do in an ideal situation, but you can't beat trigger time. I mean, if you want to become a really good shot. You have to go practice. I mean, go varmint hunting in Montana or Wyoming. Do something, but shooting two or three hundred yards is not going to give it to you. And, and here's an example of what I mean, why shooting is so important. I, every single Marco Polo hunter I sent to shoot, he just had to sure missed at least one animal, and most guys missed two or three. So none of them hit their first Marco Polo. And these are all good sheep hunters. Some of them have grand slams or parts of grand slams. But they've never shot 500 yards at 30 mile an hour winds at 20 below. And there's a big difference between shooting an Alaskan doll sheep at 250 yards in August or September versus shooting a Marco Polo in December at 15,000 feet. So they all said that they, would, they wish they would have had a different system. They wish they would have shot more. Um, and, and you don't have it typically unless I go along and hunt. If you go into Asia, you don't have somebody like me there, like a North American guy who's telling you, okay, the animal's 350 yards, you got a crosswind here and helping you. These guys don't speak English, and even if they do, they don't understand ballistics. So you're basically on your own. So that's why having a custom rifle that you practice with and shoot and knowing it intimately well will make a huge difference. It's the one thing you can control as a hunter. Um, obviously, your attitude is the most important. But if you go with your right weapon, you're going to make the guy's life a lot easier. I mean, I've had over 20 Marco Polo missed when I'm beside the hunter, and it gets old, to be honest with you. And every, I mean, because I can't shoot the animal for the hunter, and I used to videotape a lot of hunts, but now I won't videotape the guy unless I know him perfectly well. Because usually when I was on the video, something happened. He shot the rock in front of the barrel when the animal moved. He shot the snowbank. That's happened four different times with me on hunts. So it sounds like that won't happen to me, but you have to be thinking about this stuff. You have to think of what's going on, and that's why, um, again, I recommend, you know, I'm, again, off track a little bit, but as far as custom rifle, is it necessary? No. But having a custom rifle, 
that's ready to go and that you have 100% confidence is huge. Having confidence in your weapon is everything. And if you don't have a custom rifle, you go to a bar one like I do, know enough about the different guns. So when you get there, it's not like a big panic situation because it's not as good as your gun at home. So, um, so in the field shooting, we're talking about range finding or lasers. Range finders are great, um, but I've had them fail. I've had them not work in the snow. I've had them not work in the fog. And we've had a couple of animals get away because the range finder batteries died, and we're just going to get a range. And the guy wasn't comfortable shooting. That's why I like the MOA reticle for me, because I know a 20 inch animal target, there's a program that Daryl Holland makes, that a 20 inch target is this many MOAs at this range and this many MOAs at this range. So I have my gun set up for 20 yards. I mean, so a 20 inch target. So if the animal is 16 inches or is 24 inches, say, let's take 24 inches. That's four inches more than six, I mean, that's four inches more than 20, which is 20%. So if I have, if I know, using the MOA lines, that if I was shooting at a 20 inch animal and it's 300 yards, um, and then I need to add 20% more range to it, so 20% of 300 is gonna be 60 yards, be 360 yards. So if I'm shooting at a 30 inch animal like a moose, um, that would be 10 inches, it's 50% of 20 inches. And I don't wanna go into, some people aren't as good with math, but that's 50% more. So if I range find him at 300 yards, knowing he's a 30 inch animal, now I know he's gonna be, I gotta add 150 yards of that, so it's a 450 yard shot. Um, and that would have saved us several times. And I, you, you don't, it takes practice to do that though. So what I recommend is, is taking the shooting schools, getting a buddy like myself who knows how to do this kind of stuff and, and having you learn the right way. Because learning how to do it the right way the first time, it's nothing like learning on your own, but learning on your own, you, you, you're gonna make more mistakes. You're gonna learn it really well, but you're gonna make enough mistakes along the way that it might be difficult. Um, Learning how to judge the wind is huge for long range shooting. Angle compensation, we talked about that. So let's talk about rest. You need, to, if you're going to be shooting long range, you need some type of rest. You're just probably not going to free on a 400 yard shot. Um, so there's pretty much, there's two bipods that I'm really familiar with that I really like. I like the Harris bipods, we must get the pivoting company. And I like the snipe pods, which are lightweight backpack type product. They don't have any torque when you put them on your gun. But they all, the legs don't have it, and the legs can spread easily. So when you're shooting them on a hard surface, they can spread out on you. Harris Bipod is perfect if you're going to be shooting from flat surfaces. Don't mind a little extra weight. Uh, the best one for mountain hunting is what I call it. I think it's a 3 to 13 inch. I mean, 9 inch to 13 inch. That's, that's an excellent bipod. The longer one, the 13 to, to 24 inches, is too much for sheep hunting. It's more of a coyote gun or an antelope bipod. But for me, for backpacking, I, I, I usually take the snipe pod. If you, but if you guys go in Marble Bowl hunting, I'd recommend the Harris bipod, probably your animal hunting. The other thing with when you're shooting a bipod, you got to keep in mind that when you shoot on the surface that you're shooting on, it's, it's, it might change. So what the bipod does, if you say shoot from concrete to summer fall of clots to carpet, it's all going to be different surfaces. So again, the lighter your gun is, the more it recoils, the more that can change, potentially change the point of impact of the bullet. So don't assume that when you shoot from a bench, and then you put a Harris bipod on and then shoot on carpet, and then you shoot on snow, and then you shoot on something else, it's gonna always hit exactly the same. It may or may not. At close range, it probably won't matter, but at long range, it will. So think about the conditions you're gonna be hunting in and try and simulate those when you throw your rifle. So if I'm going more for pole hunting and we get over there, I want the hunters to shoot. If they bring 40 rounds of ammo, we're gonna use 20 or 30 on the target. I'm not gonna shoot all of them, but I'd rather have them do that than miss no animals and shoot 10 times of animals, and then go back and end up shooting another 10 rounds. It's better to get the animal down range when you get there. So mentally in your head, you're confident. You know that, okay, I'm at the same elevation I'm be hunting the animal at. I'm going to be shooting the same conditions. So if you lay out a blanket to shoot on, shoot the bipod on the snow the same as you would when you're in the mountains. It, it's, it's common sense, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't think about that. And also when you're shooting, you gotta get the back of the gun stabilized. A lot of guys wanna hold up here because they think it's gonna jump on them and recoil them worse. Well, especially if you have a bipod on it, it's not going to. And if you have that big of a gun that recoils that bad, you probably don't have the right gun for the job. So I like taking my hand, or even better yet, I take it like the Uncle Mike's. The ten, it's, it's, it's the ammo carrier that has five on the top and five on the bottom and it folds open and it folds back and the belt goes over. I like taking one of those and I use that and I squeeze it and I can slide it underneath the butt of my gun wedge it against my shoulder, 
so I don't have to carry a backrest. So I have my ammo with me, and that holds 10 rounds. Usually three in the gun and 10 is all you're ever gonna need for a day of hunting. I mean, I should take more than that, but that's usually what I take. So now I can slide that, so I got a perfect rest. So I can shoot 600 yards with my little snipe powder off my pack using that. Sometimes a, a pack is really nice. You can get everything leveled out, but you really want to make sure that when you get your rest there, if you're having to torque the gun a lot to hold it on target, when you shoot, most likely it's going to recoil the way you have it torqued. And when that happens, it's going to usually get right or left or high. So really think about when you have your rest, what's going to happen when I pull this trigger? Am I going to scope myself? Is the gun going to jump right or left? Um, very, very critical. Also learn how to shoot off of a bipod, I mean a tripod. Very many times I've actually shot off my video tripod or my uh, optics tripod for holding my Swarovski or like a spinal scope. Take that off, it makes a great rest, especially if you're shooting uphill. Uh, if you're shooting uphill, it's better just oftentimes shoot sitting than it is to shoot prone. Once the, the, the angle goes over 15 or 20 degrees, especially 30 degree angles, shooting prone uphill is a no no normal. So I prefer to actually use my tripod if, I, if all I have is my little bipod or Harris bipod. I'll just take my, I always take a big tripod. I don't have the little bitty tripods or spotting scopes. I always have a bigger one. So I can shoot it standing up or sitting or whatever. But that makes a great rest. I've shot several animals with fairly long range for that. It's extremely solid and extremely accurate. And again, you're not gonna scope yourself. So learn how, in my opinion, the most important thing when you find an animal you wanna shoot is finding, after you notice the one you want to shoot is finding your rest that's going to give you a really good shot and the best opportunity to make a clean kill. And the other thing is when you get there, and if you have a range finder, I range find all the situations. So let's say if I'm shooting a Marco Polo or a stone sheep. Yeah, he's right there right now, but what happens if he spooks? What happens if I'm missing? What happens if I hit him in the leg? I mean, all of this is reality of hunting. It doesn't always go perfect. So I'll range find the pass if he goes through there. I'll range find this rock over here. I'll range find down here. Especially if you're with a guy who doesn't speak English. So now you know he's 300 yards. If he runs this way, it's 450. He runs over here, it's 250. So when the shit hits the fan and everybody's panicked and screaming, shoot, shoot, big, big, you, you say, no problem. You just go over here. You already saw that you hit a little bit high. You made a correction. You know he's 300 yards now and you make a nice clean kill. Otherwise, you just ran with the binoculars and everybody's in a panic. I've seen it many times. Um, and again, it's, it's, that's why it's nice sometimes to hunt with a buddy or a guy that you know that can actually talk you through that. And so if you do miss, you know what, what's going to happen. Um, so if you're with a guy who doesn't speak English, you need to be able to see where your gun's in if you're missing. And just because you missed the first shot, I, I say you never give up. I mean, if your gun's off and you're missing by three feet, you probably don't want to be shooting. Um, and, you know, there's ethics, but at the same time, once you hit an animal, you've got to do your best possible to best possible job to try and finish him as quickly as you can. So I, I say people who brag about one-shot kills, they either don't shoot enough, I mean, they either don't shoot fast enough or they're shooting in the spine or in the head too often. I like shooting animals, especially a bigger animal, at least twice, because then there's no such thing as an animal getting away. Several times, you, you hear stories of a guy shoot an animal that falls in his tracks. Well, that could be a perfect spine shot or high shoulder. It could be a grazed spine, it could be a grazed neck, it could be a, a hole, hole through the base of the sheep's horns. So guys are giving high fives. And the animal jumps up, shakes his head, and takes off running where he basically has his pants, he's caught with his pants down. Now the animal gets away. Will the animal live or not? Who knows? But that's just not smart. So I don't put the gun away. I don't say, I don't scream, I don't yell, I don't do anything until I know 100% that animal's dead. And if, if he gets in a place where I can't shoot him, I'm going to get closer as fast as I can to try and get a follow up shot in. So again, Follow-up shots are very important, especially with archery hunting too. A lot of people, they shoot once, but they're not mentally trained to get another arrow out. Shoot again. If you've got a muscle, they reload it again. Never assume, unless the animal's stumbling around, you can see blood coming out of where his heart is. Um, Long-range shooting, you typically can't always see right where the bullet heads at first. Um, so moving targets, sometimes we have to shoot at moving targets. People say, some people say it's not ethical. Sometimes you have to take an ass shot on a wounded animal, or if you've got an animal walking away from you in the trees, um, for coming at you. So you know the angles of your bullet, know where it's going to take to, to break the bones. Um, very important. Um, and also, when you get done shooting your, your animal, put your scope back to zero if you're shooting at 500 yards. Put it back to zero. Think about this stuff. Retake the barrel. If you're in a snow and mud, you take off running down, ah, we got it, and you do a header. Now you've got your gun full. What happens if the animal jumps up and he's not dead? Well, another dumb move. It doesn't happen very often. Not very often, but it's happened enough that that's why I mentioned it. 
So I'll, we're talking about shooting schools here. Everybody, and that's your friend in the military or have a really good friend, should take a shooting school. I recommend taking a couple because some guys, some shooting schools are designed to sell you guns, not really teach you how to become a good shooter. They're there to get you on trigger time with a gun that shoots probably much better than anything most hunters have ever shot. And the guys are going to buy this gun, oh, I got a thousand yard gun now, no problem. I can go home and shoot a thousand yards of animals. Well, you really, maybe you can, but in my opinion, you can't. So I take a couple. So if you got, say, if you go to Thompson's Long Range, or you go to the gun work school, I mean, they're, they're good schools, but they're not really teaching. You're not going to be an expert shooter in one day. So they're going to try, they're going to sell your product. You're going to shoot a gun better, better than you probably ever have before. But you're still not a long range shooter. So I recommend taking other schools also where they're not trying to sell you their product, but they're trying to make your shooting skills better. And personally, I think three day schools, minimum. I mean, two and three day schools, even four day schools, you can't learn enough in one day, especially with a whole bunch of shooters, to really become a proficient shooter. So, and even if you want, one of the things I did, I went, I went and did some bench rest shooting with a friend, and I learned how to reload for bench rest shooting and, and all that, and how to shoot and how to read the wind. It's really good for understanding wind drifts, because when you're shooting a slow, fat bullet, the wind really drifts those bullets, and you can really see really easily what a little bit of wind can do. And when you're shooting in, in high wind, again, for hunting, most guys won't correct that, but because of the way the bullet's turning to the right, um, it can make the bullet hit higher or low. So if you've got a, a strong right wind, and you're shooting a bench press gun, and you have the right hand twist, that wind, that bullet will actually climb and actually hit left and high, not just left. And same thing, if you have a, a, a wind coming from the left and the bullet. So you got the rotation coming this way, a left middle makes it hit the bullet right and low. So if you're shooting a slower, lower BC type of a bullet, you can actually see that. If you're shooting at 3,500 feet per second, 300 weather beat, probably not an accurate enough rifle, um, or it kicks too much for you to see that. But when you're shooting, that's why bench rest shooting, even though I've only done it twice, was really valuable to let me know what the gun actually did. So we don't have lots of time, but I'll try and finish it up here in about five to 10 minutes. So we're going to talk about high ballistic bullets and premium bullets. Kind of the crazy these days is like the burger bullets, the high high BC, right? what, what they call ballistic coefficient. Ballistic coefficient is the, basically the bullet's ability to, to, to buck the wind, and, and, and the more aerodynamic the bullet is, typically the higher the BC. So higher BC bullets lose their velocity and energy more slowly than a short fat bullet. So if you have a ballistic coefficient of say 0.6 versus 0.3, the bull with 0.6, given the same velocity and the same caliber, is going to hit at a higher energy and have less wind drift at long range than a short fat bullet. Is it going to be more accurate? Well, at short range, probably not more accurate. At long range, more accurate because you're taking the human error of, of, of ranging and wind drift out of it. So I mentioned some of the bullets here that are, in my opinion, good ones. Um, I've never actually killed an animal bird. Some guys love them. I don't consider them an all-around bullet for all kinds of hunting. I, I consider them especially long range bullet for typically hitting animals that are broadside. Um, and they're not really designed to be shot at say 3,500 feet per second at 100 yards. I mean, it might kill the animal great, it may ha cause catastrophic explosions. Um, me personally, I typically use like a Barnes bullet, like a, an LRX or a um, tip TSX for all around. But I'm doing a lot of time in Canada, I might be hunting bears, sheep, and moose in the same hunt. So I might be shooting 50 yards and 500 yards. So to me, a bird bull is not all around. If you go on marble pole hunting or high country mule deer hunting, you're not going to be shooting at grizzly bears. You're not going to be shooting at long. I mean, at close range, then probably they're an excellent one. So I'm not going to say which bull is the best. I know I've shot a lot of animals with barns, and they've done well. There's a new bullet company called Cutting Edge Technology. It's an all copper bullet. It's a very good bullet. Some guys you should see are match kings out of the 338s. Nosler made a brand new bullet this year called the Long Range Acubon, which is shooting a good bullet. Hornady makes some really good bullets also. Um, again, find one that shoots well. Look at the pros and cons. And for every bullet, there's one that there's pros and there's cons to every bullet. Um, one thing that's very interesting, people don't realize, let's say you take a 6.5 and a 338 and a 30 caliber. And you shoot, them, and you're all shooting a bullet BC at 0.6, and they're all going at 3,000 feet per second. Guess what? You can use the same ballistic table for the 6.5, the 7 millimeter, the 30 caliber, and 338. If they all have the same starting velocity and the same ballistic coefficient, the wind drift will be the same, the bullet drop will be the same. The difference is muzzle energy. The muzzle energy of 338 is going to be substantially more than the 6.5. But if you take a 6.5 with a high ballistic coefficient of say 0.6. 
and you take a 300 magnum with a BC of 0.3, at 700 or 800 yards, a 6.5 will actually have more retained energy and hit the animal just as hard, if not harder, than the 30 pounder. So all things being equal, um, you know, the, it, the, 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 the energy is comparable to when it leaves the barrel. But when things aren't equal, when the, when the smaller caliber has a higher BC, that's why a lot of times a 6.5 or 7 millimeter with a 140 and a 6.5 or 168 and a 7 millimeter, you can even get 180s now, are very, they're actually a better long range gun than a 30 caliber with 165 pitch bullet going way faster. Those other bullets just catch up. I usually say they catch up. They don't lose their energy as much because of the ballistic coefficients. Um, so you also have penetration expansion. We talked about bone shots going away. So if you have a burger bullet, I probably wouldn't recommend doing a frontal shot in a brown bear at 30 yards. That's much better for a barn's bullet. But at a brown bear, say 300 yards behind the shoulder, brown bear really doesn't have that thick a hide, not as thick as a moose or, or, or a buffalo. So again, choose your bullet for the job. I don't believe there's, if I had to pick one gun to hunt anywhere in North America, I probably would take my 300 Magnum with 180 grain bars to tip triple shock. I mean, from zero to 600 yards, it'll kill anything that moves, frontal, going away, broadside, shooting through brush, shooting through, through anything. So if I had to pick one, I would not choose a 7 millimeter with a burger bullet and an 11 pound gun that had a 5 to 25 power scope. My personal scope I would use, I use a 3 to 12. So I can go from close range to 600 yards. You do not need, again, a 20 power scope to shoot animals at four or 500 yards. To me, it causes more harm than good. It's better on target, better on farmers, but not for hunting situations. Um, so reloading, um, if you want to reload, great. Most guys don't, sadly, don't have enough time to do it all these days. So you reload or you go to the gym and lose some weight. Obviously, I haven't done either of this in the last two months. But, um, you know, you have to choose your time. But if you really want to be an amazing shooter, you're probably going to be a better shooter if you reload. If that's your goal is to be the best shooter, if you don't reload, you're not going to have that. Because reloading will, will teach you what things you're doing, and it will give you, you have to shoot more because you have to prove your loading. So again, reloading not, it doesn't really matter, um, but it does matter if you really want to be the best shot. So there's some really good, cut, there's some really good semi-custom loads out there now, like Double Tap, and Gunworks sell some good loads. Some of the factory animal Black Hills, you know, Federal, Winchester, they're all much better than they used to be, but they're still not as good as a reload. So preparing your rifle for the hunt, some of this stuff is self-explanatory. Again, I don't assume anything when I go hunt. I don't assume anybody has anything anywhere I go hunt. I assume they don't have cleaning rods. If I'm borrowing a rifle, I assume they don't have any of that stuff. So I take everything with me. And sometimes the, the airlines will take away solvent if you have it in a solvent container. So I go like the REI or one of the stores and buy a little two ounce container that you could put little pills in it, you could put soap in it, and I just put some salt in there and I put a gun oil on it. They usually never take that. So, and always take a little bit of gun oil. There's, there's a couple, one kind I put down here that's really good in cold weather. Don't, if you buy a factory gun, you've never taken the firing gun apart, you better take it apart before you go mark the bowl or pull over honey, because it probably has a lot of, of, of grease in there, and grease does not do well at 20 below. Um, you can clean it with Avgas, whatever, when you get there. But make sure that your gun is taken apart and ready to go before you get to your hunting spot. Twice I've had firing pins freeze on other hunters' guns, and I've, I've cleaned them in the field. Um, Winchesters are really easy to clean. Remington, you can do it with a, a penny or a dime and unlock and un unscrew the firing pin mechanism. Very important to get that cleaned. Um, electrical tape, I mentioned that earlier. The Scotch Super 33 Plus, it's about three bucks a roll, but it sticks in cold weather. It's amazing stuff. And I always double it. I go, I go one over the barrel, and then I do 90 degrees and go one over the other way. That way I don't have any leaks for water. And I always make those long enough so when I shoot, I have another instant quick wrap. Because if you put the tape on when the barrel's hot, it sticks a lot better at 20 below than when, after you've waited for about three minutes. And again, like I said, retape the barrel instantly before you go to your animal. Because that's typically when people fall as they're excited and running down the hill to go look for Marco Polo. And they take a header and then fill the gun up with snow, which is not, not ideal if you have to shoot again that day. And it's not going to melt until you get back to camp. Um, I even sometimes pack a cable with me, even if I'm out on a backpack trip, in case you do take a header in a creek and you fill up your, your gun with water, you don't want rust. And so if I take a cable with little cleaning products, it works really well. So when you go on a trip, take extra targets, take some duct tape for staking them up, um, take a, take, put brand new batteries in a range finder, take a binocular for your guide, and always take a good spine scope and tripod. Most guides don't have as good a spine scope and tripod as you will, and especially foreign guides won't have anything. So take a binocular for them, take one for you. 
Don't give them your range finding binocular unless they speak really good English. And if they're shooting across a plane, don't expect the guy to range find your animal for you. I would personally, and this is the game, like a guy like me who you know, I'm going to range find a bunch of times to make sure when you're taking a shot of a range find on an animal or more polo out in the snow, not, not unlikely to hit the wrong thing. And so now, oh, he's 300 yards. Well, no, he's not. He was 500 yards because you hit the safety brush in front of the animal. So you got to think if you're range finding, take responsibility for your own shot and make sure that you do everything right so you don't miss. Um, carrying the guns or you know, when you go when you transit through the airports, most guys are going to take a little bit more plastic double gun case and hold two rifles. They're about four or five inches thick, you know, 48 or 15 inches long, and about a foot and a half across. That's pretty standard. When you're taking one of those, I fill that up with other products too. Otherwise, you're going to pay for a 50 pound bag and it's only 30 pounds. So I put as much stuff in there as I can, but not like little loose things that guys can steal. I might take a tripod or my walking stick or the cleaning rod and things like that in there. Um, and I always use a TSA certified box. Take a scope. I used to carry scopes as carry on, but I, I recommend probably not doing that these days. Um, I've never had a problem with it, but now I usually carry a scope and I'll put it in one of my other bags and I'll wrap it up in some, some uh, long pants or some insulated jacket to protect it, maybe even stick inside of a boot. But it's just nice to have that extra scope along. So when you get, and I used to, and I still do sometimes, but some airlines, they don't want it that way anymore. I used to take a shotgun case, 36 inches long. It's called, it's for, it's for a takedown shotgun. I took my rifle up apart, so I had the barrel and the stock. So now it goes in a 36 inch case instead of a 48 or 50 inch case. And that's really great for transit. Um, but like Turkish Air, when I, when I traveled, they wanted me to take the gun case out of the duffel. So now I got two pieces of, of, of check luggage. But check with the airlines. If you can do it, it's nice because you can go through an airport and nobody knows you have a gun because it's in a 36 inch box inside of a green duffel bag with bells and wheels on it. And yeah, you can get a purple bag if you want to look like a golfer or something. And so that's really nice because you don't, nobody knows. Um, but you know, you know, but you better declare it because one time I forgot to declare it almost and that was a no-no because they just took it and they threw it on the con con conveyor belt before I could say anything. And so I had to explain to TSA how come there wasn't something in there, but they literally threw it on there and took it away before I could say anything because they didn't realize it was a gun. So you have to think about that. Some people use a tough box which looks like it's designed for like carrying golf clubs and those are nice too, but they're really awkward when you get overseas here. They don't really fit inside the small jeeps very well. So always take a small, a soft gun case and have your gun case handy so when you get over there, in fact, if you're using a top pack, put your, put your gun inside the gun, soft gun case or inside the rifle scabbard. And so when you get there, you can take it out easily and then leave that big hunk of junk at, at the, at the at, in town because a lot of times those jeeps are small and they take up too much room and then they got to strap them on top. And you know, I've heard this several times, it hasn't happened to me, but guys are going over there and they're driving through and they're getting to the, the Marco Polo area. Here comes a big herd of Ibex running right by in front of a monster or a wolf, and everybody's guns packed in their gun case. So once you leave the town and you leave all the military checkpoints, again, get your gun out just in case. We, we have actually shot the wolf driving to camp once because we had the gun out ready. So yeah, well, that one actually wasn't ready, but we, we scrambled and got it ready quick. But luckily, that wolf didn't run off. Um, so if you're if you're horseback hunt, going on horseback hunts, get a custom leather scabbard. Again, most outfitters do not have two hundred fifty dollars, three hundred dollars leather scabbards that fit the new guns. They have something that may have been built twenty years ago and may or may not protect your rifle. The barrel may or may not even fit it. And so, I mean, the good outfitters do. But if you're going to do a lot of horseback hunting, buy your own scabbard. And if you got a, your soft scabbard, you, you take for like in the Jeeps, get a good one. Don't get the ten dollar one from Walmart. I mean, the very, the, get one if you can that has a built-in sling on it, so you can even carry it with a sling. It's just really nice to have that uh, sling. In, in Central Asia, if you're hunting Marco Polo, you're not going to have a, a, a scabbard on your horse. I've taken them before, but they're awkward, they're pain in the butt. The guides don't like to use them, they think they're going to sort the horse. So the, my favorite sling is one by Slow Can, Slow Can Outdoors. It's a, it's, it's a rubberized sling, but it splits and goes over my head, so now it packs. So I got two points of impact, so instead of one. And then also what it does is it puts the trigger guard off to your side so it doesn't dig into your back. So when you're riding the horse all day, it doesn't dig into your, into your side and cause bruising. And I can ride all day, every day with that sling. It's, it's really good. The only time I don't hunt with a sling is if you're going after a dangerous animal in the brush and it might snag, I take it off. But normally, I usually have a sling on my rifle. 